folks. Um, how are we doing there, Martin? Yeah, what's up? All right, and it's going to be 201, so I guess we're going to have the great Martin Pure Hate Boss up here, one of the back checks for developers. Also, uh, an expert on CUDA systems, which I say often, would you be just doing a presentation at like ISSA conference on CUDA systems? Sure. For those who don't know CUDA, and this is me as a lay person, I am using um, essentially video cards for the parallel. Parallel, ah, parallel processing abilities to really pack and pass with the other mathematics fast. Uh, some really nifty stuff, and uh, Martin's done a lot of work in that particular arena. I share a service online that people can crack the stuff for a nominal It costs a couple bucks, I mean, like 10 bucks WPA, between 5 and 30 for NTLM. I mean, he, he also runs a uh, storefront on uh, Bardstown Road, correct? What is it? What, what's the name of your company? Computer Rehab. Computer Rehab? Yeah. <laughs> MyComputerRehab.com, though. Is That's it? the website, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to give you this microphone and let you do your thing, and I'm going to take my coffee and get caffeinated. Computer Rehab was taken by some internet squatters, so I had, it. I had to improvise. And feel free anyway, to... Uh, uh, my presentation is mostly videos. Um, I, I, I hope everybody can see. I'm also going to stop along the way, and we'll talk about the commands. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm also available um, for help afterwards. But my first answer is usually try harder. So we'll see how that goes. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, I call this What Do We Do Now? Uh, we're going to talk about post-exploitation techniques. Um, first of all, you got to get the obligatory who am I out of the way. Um, I'm a core developer for Backtrack Linux. Um, like Adrian said, I own a local IT business called Computer Rehab. I also uh, co-maintain a website called QuestionDefense.com. It's Alex's. Well, he's not here, but my friend Alex that I'm with, he started it, and uh, I maintain it with him. It's uh, technical questions for technical problems. It's uh, all the way from the simplest question about how to turn on your iPhone all the way up to exploit development and everything in between. Um, I'm also a hacker. I want to change that to, uh, thanks to Verizon, I'm going to change that to Narcissistic Vulnerability Pimp next. <laughs> and uh, no, I don't really have a real job. And uh, more importantly is who am I not? Uh, I'm not really a teacher. I'm not really an instructor. I'm definitely not a lawyer. Uh, I'm not an expert, and I'm for sure not responsible for what anybody does with this information. So... Um, after we do all that hard work like Elliot showed us to uh, successfully exploit a system, um, what are we going to do next? Um, a lot of times on a penetration test, uh, simply getting a calc.exe like uh, Elliot showed us is going to be enough. You know, putting a random text file on some CEO's desktop or something like that. But uh, but it, but generally in a real test, um, you want to people want to see how far you can infiltrate the network and. Uh, once you get a foothold on the outside of the network, there's a vast amount of stuff and mayhem you can cause inside the network. And uh, some of that stuff we've already looked at in, in a little bit of um, depth, like the pivot, for example, to uh, that uh, power cycle showed us to get onto other subnets in the network. And uh, everybody went over briefly a couple of interpreter commands. I'm going to try to um, show a couple simple things and a couple cool things you can do with it. So. Uh, uh, we want to gather password hashes and other valuable system information. Um, password hashes are the best uh, because of the PS execute uh, pass the hash command. I'm going to show that. Um, uh, so, and, and generally, in most environments I've been in, the admin password is the same across the network. Um, um, more importantly, we might want to set up a backdoor to maintain more permanent system access. Um, sometimes an exploit can be noisy. Sometimes you want to get in there, set up a backdoor, and take off and uh, let the Monday morning blow over before you come back. Um, sniff packets for interesting information and uh, importantly want to erase our tracks. Um, so how are we going to do this? There's lots of ways to do this. Um, most of them are tedious and long and involve a lot of assembly. So um, instead, uh, HD Moore and the guys at Metasploit have provided us with the meterpreter um, Payload, which we've seen a little bit of already. So generally, um, we're asking ourselves, what the heck is a meterpreter? It's kind of an odd word. It actually stands for the meta interpreter, which is an advanced payload that's included in the Metasploit framework, like I said. 
Sounds cool. What does it do? Um, it provides complex and advanced features that would otherwise be tedious to implement in assembly, like I said. Um, it easily uploads, downloads files, retrieves password hashes. Um, one of the coolest things Dave already touched on is it has the ability to migrate to a completely legitimate process. Um, you always want to migrate to something like Dave said, like Explorer, EXE, something that's not generally turned off. You do not want to migrate to like, uh, you know, something that somebody would, would open up, use, and then turn off. Um, one of my favorite things about Meterpreter is uh, we touched on it a little bit. Carlos Perez is kind of the leader. His online handle is Dark Operator. He's kind of the leader in uh, Meterpreter scripting. And uh, he has pretty much scripted all these tasks. Um, I'm going to show some of them step by step, but almost all of them have been now scripted uh, where they can just be run really simply. Um, I think the most important thing about Meterpreter is that all the extensions and the Meterpreter DLL itself are executed entirely from memory and they never touch the disk. So um, that allows them to execute under the radar of most antivirus detection. Really, the only time you touch the disk is when you start to modify files and that kind of thing. Um, there's a time stop command for that. I'm actually not going to cover it because it's kind of long and lengthy. But you can, um, after you modify a file with the time stop command, you can uh, go back and change the access time of the files so that people can't tell you were there. Um, a lot of people ask, there's all kinds of backdoors and Trojans. Why should I use this one? Um, it's already built into the Metasploit framework. Um, it can be created as a standalone binary, just executable, and uh, attached to any other exploit or any other means of getting it onto the system. Um, sometimes you can be creative. I mean, I've heard of people dropping off a CD at the front desk saying, you know, 120 days of free antivirus, and the first secretary puts it in and wants to show it to her boss. And I mean, there's just all kinds of ways you can get an EXE on a system. Um, Meterpreter can hijack session tokens. You can impersonate other users on the system. And uh, Meterpreter makes it really easy to create custom scripts. If you have a custom job that you want to do, you can literally go in and get one of the existing scripts and just modify it. Um, they're very easy to write. You don't even need to know. They're all written in Ruby um, primarily, but you don't even need to know a lot of Ruby to um, write them. All right, so this has already been gone over. I'm probably going to go through this one a little bit fast, just some basic interpreter usage. <coughs> Hopefully everybody can see it. If anybody has any questions, I'll stop and explain the command. These are fairly simple. Um, I've already exploited the system with the MS0867. Here's the basic health, health commands. As you can see, there's a lot of them. Um, most of the commands in here are fairly Linux-based, change directory. Here's the PS command, the process list. Um, generally, the first thing you want to do is migrate to a legitimate process, which is what I'm going to do here. See how I migrate to Explorer, EXE. It's kind of our personal favorite. But there's plenty of other ones that you know aren't closed all the time. Get UID is always going to show us what user we are. So right now, I'm running as the victim loser, who is the uh, who is the uh, regular user. There's a get privs extension, which will tell you all the privileges that the user is running under, so you can see what kind of access you have. System info is gonna tell us what kind of system it is. Um, idle time will tell us how long the user has been idle. This is especially useful if you wanna watch a VNC section, session or take a screenshot or something. If you wanna catch your employees on Facebook, you wanna wait till they're, uh, till they're on the system. Uh, get local working directory gives us the uh, directory on the attacking machine, and then get wd get working directory gives us the uh, directory on the. Uh, that stopped kind of fast. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> so uh, get working directory gives us the directory on the victim machine, and uh, the commands are the same pretty much for Linux, ls, you know, list, change directory, that kind of thing. Um, there's only one. Uh, there's a couple uh, weird things that I'll show you later on when you're uploading and downloading files. Meterpreter, for some reason, when you're uh, uploading files to a Windows system, you need to use a double slash because it doesn't um, doesn't see the slash correctly. So this is the plain old hash dump. Um, this is one of the first things that I would ever do before I compromise the system. First, I would migrate to a legitimate process. Then you would immediately get the hash dump going um, just to make this video about two seconds longer. I, uh, I show a copy of them and paste them over here to our uh, attacking system in a dump file. And uh, 
the reason I do this, like Adrian said, I do a lot of work with CUDA and NTLM crashing or uh, NTLM cracking. Um, it won't take a list like this, so uh, use the cut command and remove the LM hashes and the usernames, and uh, that'll just give us a nice list of uh, NTLM hashes that we can upload to uh, you know a server like mine or or, uh, or crack locally or whatever. Just show you the file there. So there's our nice oops. Anyway, that was a really nice list of NTLM hashes if you would have seen it. So uh, uh, here's running some of the included scripts. If you want to find where the scripts are, they're in the pen test exploit framework three scripts interpreter directory. I will say that occasionally some of them are broken. Um, they're not kept up quite as quick as the Metasploit development is. So if you find one that's broken, uh, you got a couple options. You can use another one, you can complain to Carlos, or you can fix it yourself. <laughs> So this is just me using our good old MS068 or MS0867 exploit. It always works. Um, got to get our UID. As you can see, this time I've exploited on the level of the system user. Um, first thing you always want to run is to check VM. So this is going to show us that it's a virtual machine. Uh, run get countermeasures is going to tell us the status of the Windows firewall on the system. We can tell that our firewall is enabled at this point. That could be interesting information for later usage. Um, this next script is going to be called get local subnets. This can actually be done with the IP config command, but if there were more subnets, it would actually show them here, and I would be um, inclined to do a pivot. Uh, run kill AV um, will kill about 95% of antiviruses on the target. I, I have noticed that it won't kill Microsoft Security Essentials. The next, uh, let me pull on. The next uh, script is a little bit more in depth. Some of the scripts have a help command, so you can give them the dash H in case you want to see the commands. Um, I'm going to do this two different, way, different ways with remote desktop and with Telnet. They both have about the same options. Um, the reason I want to show this is because you can run the get GUI script and what it will do is um, turn on remote desktop, add a port and firewall, and that type of thing for, on the victim computer. But um, the, the, reason, the reason that it can be tricky is because unless you crack a hash and you know the current username and password, you'll have to actually create a new user and password, which is really cool that it does that, but it's also um, really not cool when the system admin of the victim machine sees a new user on the box. So um, in the first example, I'm just going to do it. I already, of course, know the username and password. Um, so I'm going to show it done that way with not creating a user. So in that case, I would just use the E option and enable, or enable RDP only. Um, so as you can see, um, it was already enabled. But if it wasn't enabled, um, it would say enabled, and it also opens a port in the local firewall. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use our desktop, and I'm going to connect on over there. And uh, there we go. i got a remote desktop session, and I'm actually logging in as the current user. This is another place the idle time command comes in handy. I know that the guy's been away. If it's noon and he's been away for 33 minutes, I've probably got 28 more before. So as you can see, I got a remote desktop session that way, and I did not have to add a user to the system, which is um, important. But I'm also going to show um, there's the exact same script get telnet, so I'm going to show that, and uh, during the get telnet, I'm going to add a user and a password. See that help commands are generally about the same. But at this point, I'm going to give it the dash U and the, and the dash P for a username and password. We'll use the old root tour. Can't believe it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty neat. That skill. Uh, man, I had to video it all. Sorry. <laughs> I did not pray to the live demo guys this morning. <laughs> so I am going to do a live demo of uh, Metasploit Express at the end. Hopefully. <laughs> anyway, so you see I tell that in. Use my login that I created. 
Something that's cool about the scripts is it automatically adds me to the administrator group, which is right where I want to be to talk some topic. So that's that script. Really useful. That script is even more useful on newer systems where Telnet is not enabled by default. This script is called a persistence. This creates a persistent backdoor. And what it does is it uploads the backdoor and then it immediately connects a reverse shell session back to your back to your computer. Um, it also adds entries to the registry so that it will um, be there on reboot. So that's what I'm going to show. See how it added the registry entries to auto run when it restarts. So then I'm going to reboot the Windows system right here. Uh, well, first I'm going to background this. First I'm going to start my handler. Anytime you have a reverse shell, you got to start a handler to accept the connection. There's my second shell has already come. But what I'm really interested in is that shell being there when I reboot the machine. One, one caveat this though is it does not clean itself up. Correct. So it does not clean itself up. So you would manually have to go into the registry after you are finished and delete those delete those entries. Um, here's oh, wait a minute. Here's my favorite script before it runs. It's almost just like the scraper script, except for I think it gathers a little bit more information. Um, it's called the Win Enum script, and what it does is it runs all those uh, really tedious net sh commands that are um, really hard to remember on a Windows box, and it saves them all really nicely in a directory, kind of like the one Adrian showed. It's similar. I haven't determined which one has the best information yet. See how it gets all my subnets, gets all my routes, gets all my net stat information, net accounts. It always hangs here for some reason. Domains, administrator groups, firewall config, task list. This is just an absolute goldmine of information, especially if you need to further infiltrate the system. And, uh, and given, uh, given somebody on a penetration test, this much information will make their jaw drop, I promise. All right, so just to show the information, we're just going to go over here. But they'll be located in the .nsf3, whatever uh, user you're running as, logs, winning them. So I'm just going to show you what some of the text files look like. There's a bunch of them. Um, some of the more interesting ones are startup programs. I'll show you why um, when we eject an exe here in a few minutes. Um, Injecting an EXE in a startup program is always good, since you know the back door will be there. It has the hash down, of course. <coughs> Programs list. As you can see, we got SQL server running. That's always interesting information. Here's the startup list. So now I can look at one of these programs, and, uh, and I can look at something to inject my EXE into. All right, so... Um, at this point, I've got this video on creating, encoding, and uploading a interpreter backdoor. If anybody has any questions, just stop me. Um, I think I went through the whole exploit here. Sorry. If anybody doesn't know how to do the MS0867 uh, exploit when they leave here. <laughs> Switch to the command line version of Metasploit, and I'm going to create a payload. 
MSF payload, Windows, interpreter, reverse TCP. Um, I'm going to have to set my local host, which would be my attacking machine. Oh, it appears I forgot the IP address. <laughs> Good to always check it. Make sure I can't tell you how many times I've put the wrong IP address in there. Um, set the local port. It's 444 by default on almost every exploit, so if you like that, you can just do that. But um, like some people said before me, that's monitored by uh, a great many uh, monitoring programs. Then we're going to pipe that into MSF encode. I know I've already gone over this a few times. Um, something nobody showed was the B option, which is to omit a certain byte. So I want to omit all the null bytes from my um, shell code. Then uh, the T flag is for executable. And then the O flag is, of course, for the output file. <laughs> and then E is the encoder. I'm going to use that. Well, when I spell it right, I'm going to use the x86 Shikata encoder, which is supposed to be the best. If I ever had a waste for Metasploit, I wish they'd give these encoders easier names to remember. <laughs> All about the like, like, really good. <laughs> anyway, um, the C option is how many times you want to encode it. Um, at this point, most AV has, uh, has caught on to most of this stuff, so now we're in the double and triple encoding, um, which you sometimes have to do. Um, there's some EXEs I've found that can't be encoded. I tried to encode Skype um, the other day, and they actually use a packer just like um, just like, uh, just like uh, crackers use with their systems, which I think is really odd. But anyway, so I was not able to inject an EXE in this line, just in case anybody was wondering. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my reverse handler to accept the connection. Let's just use exploit multi-handler. Um, the important thing about this is to set the payload as the exact same payload that you put in the executable. system on the subnet for a hash, which I, which I haven't tried out yet, but I will as soon as I 
head home now. Or else I probably would have incorporated it into this. So I'm going to search. I'm going to use the uh, SFB PS execute. Sorry, I used all the console. I, I didn't use the web app at all because it's on the way out, as far as I know. So we're going to show the options. There's just the um, normal options, except for we can set the password as the hash. <coughs> so we're going to set our remote host. And real quick, the thing with this too is if you if you uh, exploit a system and you notice that the LM hash is the same, I think it's A A B. Or three is the initial start point. It means that the hash value is over um, over 14 characters, so the LM hash isn't there, but it will still work without that. So if you don't have an LM hash and you have the anti LM hash, it'll still work. You put all zeros in there, right? Uh, no, what, what Metasploit will do is it, or Metasploit will work. It will do it itself. From. It'll do it itself. So okay. Yeah. So see how I set my SMB password, and I just use the complete LM hash and the colon and the anti LM hash. Going to set my payload as. Interpreter, of course, since that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Burst TCP. And uh, <coughs> make sure I got all my options correct. Got to set the local address. Yeah, I think that's going to work. It's hard when I look at you. <laughs> He had our friend DigiP make this really cool uh, presentation for him, and uh, his website's called Sec Maniac, but it came out as Sack Maniac. <laughs> <laughs> well, needless to say, I've heard that the rest of my life. So. Right. Anyway, so what happened here, as you can see, is we exploited the system. We got a shell. You can see how the hash went right in there. Um, I just hit the shell command. That gives us a log on to System32 since we logged on as the administrator. We use the administrator hash for that. Um, next one I'm going to show, Adrian already showed this, so we'll go through it real fast. Uh, clearing the event logs. Um, there is one thing about clearing the event logs is it's not actually perfect. It does leave one significant thing behind, which is, um, I'll show on this, which is a 517 event. So if you get to work and uh, your event logs are totally empty except for one 517 event, you can be pretty sure what happened. Now I'm going to go over here. I just went just a little bit farther. I'll just show you the actual log in Windows. See what happens to it. So as you can see, I got all kinds of stuff in here where I've been messing around all day. So now we'll go back over here and we'll run the command. Right up here, and then it actually used to be a script, and now it's a now it's a command. My spelling was a failure that day. Maybe it always is. <laughs> a lot. Anyway, so we'll go back over here, kind of refresh the page. As you can see, under security, I've left a 517 event, but everything else is clear. So this is a perfect indication that you have been hacked by the interpreter. Um, yeah? How hard would it be to write in Ruby your own little thing, but just like selectively kill all the records from this one account or something? Sure. I mean, you would just have to look at that. You could actually look at the older clear environment script, and you could probably uh, work off of that. I mean, it used to be a it used to be a script, and then it was so, you know, it, it was so well used that people incorporated it into uh, into the basic commands. But it, it probably wouldn't be that hard to only to maybe only clear critical errors or anything like that, as long as you you know. We'll get call us on that. 
As long as you got the syntax correct, you know what I mean, or only clear a user or something like that. So this is going to be injecting a shell into an executable. Um, I didn't want to be too dangerous. When I do this, I like to pull down something that's already running on the system, inject the exe back into it, and send it back up. But um, for this, what we're going to use is just putty, which is what they use in the Metasploit Unleashed course. Um, and I actually name it something different. So we're going to go over here, and we're going to... Um, what I showed there at the beginning is generally you want to go on a user machine and see what kind of processes are running. Um, we're just going to pretend that this victim had putty. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to replace his putty with our putty indirectly, and then next time he executes it, we'll get a reverse shell. Um, I tried this with a lot of different um, programs. It works with some. Like I said, it didn't work with Skype. It didn't work with Trillion. Um, it, it worked with the ALG.exe service. Um, there's a couple of does. It's really trial and error. Um, oh, let me stop this. So. Yeah, I had problems getting it to work with Notepad. I could get it to actually copy the metadata. But Notepad would not be functioning as it should have been. Right, and that's the thing is that whenever you want to do this, you really want to test this out at home and make sure that your EXE is actually functioning. Um, when I did it with Skype, it did inject the EXE, but it, the Skype would not function. It would open the shell, but it would never open Skype. So that. So uh, here we are back at MSF Payload, the same as we've been doing um, into MSF Encode, but instead at this point, um, we want to use the K option, which stipulates to use the template that we are um, that we are defining with the X option. So slash root dot putty dot exe is my original executable, and K tells it to use that template and just inject my exe into it, and then my output file is going to be putty underscore hack dot exe. Now, generally, I would just call it putty exe so that it would replace the original, but we're trying to trying to uh, err on the good side here, so we're going to do it this way just for a demo. We're going to encode it six times. Like I said, nowadays you want to look into multiple encoding. I know we've gone over some of this before, but the way I learned it is just to do it over and over and over again. Um, really the only way to learn some of this stuff. So now, this is uh, what Adrian showed a little bit before. Um, this is the MSF command line. Um, I just did this so I didn't make any typos. I think I was mad about all those other ones I made. But anyway, so uh, we can actually script this. It's just a complete line. Um, as you can see, we set our payload encoder, our local host, our local port, and then the actual payload at the end. And so we'll just execute. Oh, whoops. Hold on. Let me just uh, go back. That one's a good one. <laughs> See if I can find the video here. Sorry. Oh, that's not even the right video. Sorry. Oh, here it is. See, we start the multi-handler, give it the payload. All right, so over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload that file. Um, just so everyone can see what I'm talking about, see how I got the double slashes um, <coughs> between the Windows directories of where I want to upload it to. Um, for some reason, um, interpreter needs that, otherwise it um, sees them as escapes. I I've had some success with quotes, but the double slashes always work. So I'm just going to put it on the desktop. Not very stealthy, but I just want to execute it for the uh, 
So I successfully uploaded it. Then I believe I go over here to my XP box. So there's my putty hacked. I'm going to start it. As you can see, it works just like normal. The user has no idea what's really going on. And if I go over here, you can see that I have an interpreter session open and it connected right back to me. I'm going to migrate over to another process. Because the user is eventually going to close Putty, which is why I migrate over to Explorer. It's kind of a perfect example, and I still have my shell. All right, let me go back to the. Uh, <coughs> start a uh, sniffer on the target network and we can save all the data we need in a PCAP file for later analysis. Um, so we're going to use our sniffer. We've got to load the extension. Uh, it's got its own set of commands down here. You need to look at the sniffer interfaces and see what you got available. Some systems, of course, will have more than others, depending on your access and depending on how you're in there. So as you can see, I have a VMware Ethernet adapter. So I'm going to start the sniffer. Um, and like I said, generally you would want to migrate to a more legitimate process because you would want to let this run for quite some time. So I've started my capture. So Ooh. some time passes. <laughs> oh, that was cool. I didn't think you. <laughs> it's like that movie Hackers. <laughs> That's what I was going for. <laughs> anyway, so this is later on. Like Angelina uh, you can actually do sniffer stats, and you can make sure that you have a correct amount of data. Uh, obviously, I was lazy and only run, run for like 10 minutes. But um, you can let this run for hours, days. Um, the problem with letting it run for days is you actually have to download the file. Um, so when you dump it, you dump it to your local directory, temp slash xpcapture.cap, see how it downloads the file, and then stop the sniffer, and you can open up the data file with whatever your favorite um, favorite thing is. I think I opened it with Wireshark here, but you can use Chaos Reader. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can use to open up the cap file. There's my file. As you can see, I don't use wire short much, <laughs> at least on this system. <laughs> anyway, so there's our capture from the system. This can be really useful for a variety of different reasons. Um, getting subnets, protocols, all that kind of stuff for further um, exploiting the system. All right, so there are a bunch of topics from Interpreter that I didn't cover. I think Dave's going to try and do a couple of them. Um, with his key logging, um, the key logging is similar to the uh, to the uh, sniffer that I just showed. You basically start the key logger, stop the key logger, <laughs> dump down the data. I don't want to do too many of the same things. Uh, pivoting I didn't cover, but um, PowerCycle showed that really well. Um, I didn't cover Metasploit as a payload, which is actually really cool, but um, HD Moore told me I did get it going, but it was really slow, and so... Um, what that is, is they've now created some really, really, really small versions um, that are packed with Sigwin and everything of Metasploit. And so you can actually um, encode and pack a really small version of Metasploit and you can send it to the machine and then you can start it up MSF console and then you're on that machine and you can further attack more machines and you have all the exploits available to you. Um, writing interpreter scripts I didn't cover, that would be a whole hour by itself. Um, incognito I didn't cover. I think they might look at that. That's session and token impersonation. Um, the time stomp I didn't cover and the screen capture Adrian covered. 
Um, some of the useful links that I got are Metasploit.com, of course, uh, the Offensive Security Metasploit Unleashed, um, Carlos, uh, Dark Operator's website, um, uh, Mubix's website, Room 362, Egypt's blog, and then uh, Carnal Ownage. Is that Chris Pageant's site? I think. Anyway, but so those are all good Metasploit sites. Uh, also, um, like Elliot was saying, if you want to learn more about this kind of stuff, the uh, uh, offensive security classes are the absolute best um, for this type of uh, this type of work. Um, some Metasploit ninjas that you can follow on Twitter: HD Moore, Egypt, Mubix, Chris Gates, Dave over here, and Carlos Perez. And if you have any questions, kind of like I said earlier, try harder. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> Martin, do you have, are you are you doing the uh, Metasploit Express thing? Oh crap! I totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Does everyone want to see Metasploit Express real quick? Hell yeah! Okay. Sorry, what, do we have any confirmation on that deal? Or I'm still, I'm still for it, so. Okay. Can you all, you all just have to give me like two seconds? I tell you what. If anybody does not. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That set up an alarm for the <laughs> If anybody does not want to hear so uh, I'm just gonna scan the subnet just to show everybody if anybody does not want their computer scanned, just unplug it real quick. Um, just to, to for fast. So um Metasploit Express works in Windows, Linux, uh, anything you want. Um, it's basically just a web browser type application. Um, I'll show it up here. I'm lame. I just use root tour for my login, so I never forget it. <laughs> anyway, so here's the interface. You just log in. You create a user. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's it. This is fairly. Um, Fairly nice. Something that's useful for this that um, Dave was talking about earlier is um, once we grab our hash with a hash dump, we could actually put it in here and we could scan entire subnets with that PS execute uh, PS execute exploit, and it would uh, and it would uh, give us, I mean, however many shells were vulnerable across the network. So if you got you know 255 mach four machines on your network and they all use the same admin password. Um, once I had the admin hash, I could effectively own all the machines. I see you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's, it's, it's 640 under my control, and so you can actually all, show you the interface of all of the Metasploit, which is really nice. So uh, all you want to do is just create a project name, create a network range, and then you want to create the project. Um, this also integrates perfectly, of course, with Nexpose, since they're both Rapid7 projects. I'll plug that too. Um, if you wanted to, uh, you would have to have Nexpose installed, I think. Um, but if you wanted to, um, there's three different things you can do. The first thing you can do is scan, which is basically an Nmap scan. So we're going to do that, and then maybe I'll talk about it some more. Um, it's generally good to exclude your own address, but I'm not going to, so oh well. So um, you can set the port scan speed. Since we're all friends here, we'll do insane. <laughs> so then you just hit scan. If you had an SMB hash, for example, you could put it right here or an SMB. So we would put administrator and uh, whatever that hash is that we got from the administrator uh, uh, console. So then you just hit scan. Then what happens is you get a task list comes up over here. And uh, this is basically just host discovery. Because when you actually run the exploit part, you probably want to trim down. You don't want to just bash up the whole entire subnet, unless you really don't like the company, I guess. But anyway, so, and then uh, you can go over here to overview. It'll say scanning, and you can go over here to host. I mean, this is really easy to use. I, I don't have any results yet, but this may take a second. And, of course, there's the progress. So then, uh, the kind of the kind of way you would do this is, you would do the scan. So, wow, a lot of people didn't unplug their computers. <laughs> so anyway, I got 31 hosts discovered. It's going to tell me the amount of services. Um, the next thing I would want to do is I would want to go to Nexpose and I would want to kind of trim down my list 
and uh, see if I could find any exploits that uh, match that system. This might take a minute. I hope everybody knows. We got 15 minutes, I guess. It'll look cool when it's done, I promise. Um, this is still in beta, but um, it's going to, at the same time Metasploit 3.4 comes out, this is going to come out. Um, if you're interested in it, it's $3,000 for a yearly license. Um, but this, uh, and, but it also comes with, you know, support from the actual creators of Metasploit. Um, they have an IRC channel on the free node network in Metasploit. You can go in there and uh, they're nicer about questions than I am. Unless <laughs> 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 you mention backtrack. Unless <laughs> 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 you mention backtrack, of course. Then you're in good shape. Why do you have problem questions? Say what? <laughs> if you don't keep the channel on topic, it gets all out of hand. Start talking about the club in Fiji last night and everything else. <laughs> anyway, so as you can see, I've got 91 services detected. Um, oh, it's not taking too long. I'm 88% done. Um, the one special VM I had is one that I mentioned earlier. is one that uh, HD Moore gave me. It's actually got four um, really obscure vulnerabilities. So he says, I was only able to make one of them work, but he claims that four of the services on there are vulnerable. So if he says they are, they are. Who am I to say they're not? So I'm not going to go through the next pose part, but next pose actually has a free community edition. Um, so you don't have to pay for that. You can download that. It's a vulnerability scanner. Um, along the same lines as Nexus and Nessus or however you say it and some of the other ones. Um, generally, you would probably want to use a couple of them, but if you're going to use something like this Metasploit Express, it's better to use this one because it's already integrated. Um, the coolest thing about this is the report, which I'd like to show you at the end. This is just a, this does not take the place for real penetration testing and real exploit development. However, this can dramatically um, speed up some of the processes, and it also makes this really cool report that you can give to the CEO and look cool without a lot of paperwork. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over here and I'm going to hit the exploit button. So here's all my target addresses. Um, now once again, I would uh, generally, if, if, I, if I went down this list and I saw you know, I don't really want to attack Dave's machine, which I do. But anyway, so I would exclude his address or my own address or whatever. Um, another thing you can set is what Dave was talking about earlier is now the exploits actually have ratings. Um, so like low means it probably never works, it crashes the box. You know, normal means one out of every five times it crashes the box. Excellent means that generally works every single time. Um, so you can set that. Um, the problem with setting low is that, of course, you're going to bring down half the network. So we're just going to do good, for example. You can do the number of concurrent exploits. I haven't really played around with this all this much, so we'll just leave it at the default. Um, you can only get one shell on each box, but that's no fun, so we'll uncheck that. Um, you can ignore the known fragile devices. Um, I really don't have not investigated that, but I assume it just does that by OS detection, but we'll uncheck that. That's not fun. And then you want to skip exploits that do not match the OS so we don't waste a bunch of time. And then you literally just hit the exploit button. And uh, it's all um, automated. So unfortunately, this might take a minute since there's 971 possible exploits. <laughs> so hopefully I'll get a shell off one of these boxes so I can show you what it looks you like. Did I get one? Yeah. So once you get one, you go into here in the Sessions tab. See? So this is the VM that uh, that uh, HDM gave me called Metasploitable. So it's less than a minute old. Oh, there's another one. So and it tells you what the exploit is that got it. So we'll run that run for a minute and see if we get a few more. So far, these are all RBMs, so everybody's in good shape. <laughs> well, anyway, since we're running out of time, we'll just go. You can interact with the session. Oh, there's another. Uh-oh. Oh, that might be mine. Anyway, so, uh, so for example, you can interact with the session. Uh-oh. So you can hit session three. 
And then you can see there's a variety of options. Um, like, I may just want to collect the system data, which is similar to that win enum script. Um, this would be a good thing to not touch the disk. Um, this will give me a, a, a virtual desktop, which is like our desktop. Uh, the problem is that it will alert the user. Um, we can just access the file system. Like I said, you're totally uh, in memory until you change a file, and then you are no longer in memory. We can just get a point old command show. So we'll just do that just to show what it looks like. So then it opens up this neat thing, and it gives us some interpreter DLL. We can hit the PS command like we did. Then we might want to migrate to uh, explore. We'll just hear notepads right there, so we'll migrate to that. Anyway, and then you can do all the same. Then you can do all the same interpreter commands that you've been doing, you know, hash dump or upload or whatever you want to do. And uh, so you can background it, for example. And what's cool is these all open up in different tabs. So now I can go back over here and I can go back to my sessions tab. And at the same time, I can open a session on this box, for example. See what kind of options I got. I haven't actually done this collect system data, so let's try it, see what happens. Yeah, if you go to the main page, you can actually hit collect, and it'll do it for all of them. So when I had 600, when I had 600 uh, you know, machines that I might collect, hit collect, it collected all the information from all of them. So it does actually screen dumps and everything in the system. So oh, cool. Pretty, pretty wicked. All right, so it looks like we can, like I said, I haven't, I haven't played with this. Um, so we can collect the system information, passwords, screenshots, SSH keys. Let's just get it all, what the heck. So I'm going to collect the data. And I'm assuming that it gives it back to us in a nice file. Um, see if the report's ready yet. Now, this is the part that I really like, is that you can generate a report, and you can generate this based on a lot of different things. An executive summary, a large report, you know, a report focused on the network services. So we want to show our boss we did a good job, so we'll give him the fancy executive report. So addresses to include, so we want to uh, include them all. If we just wanted to do a, uh, or a report on one host, we would do that. So here's the host summary. Tells whether we compromised it or not. Tells how many vulnerabilities. If we would have run Expose, we probably would have got a lot more vulnerabilities. Shows all the host names, the OSs. Um, I ran it at my store. It was pretty smart on... Um, Cisco and, and, and all the different things that I had in my store. So the OS detection was pretty good. Anyway, so go back to reports. So I guess that's about it. If anybody's interested in seeing it anymore, I can um, show you later. Um, I haven't looked at this modules tab. <laughs> just exploit list. Is that just exploit list? Okay, so you would go to modules if you just want to find more information about each exploit. All right, that's it. Thank you.